What's going on everybody and welcome to part 5 of the PyTorch tutorials for deep learning with Python. In this video, in the coming videos, we're going to be talking about a new type of neural network and that is the convolutional neural network or really a new type of layer because generally we tend to mix convolutional layers with like at least like dense layers or what we're calling in PyTorch are linear layers and basically just your fully connected layers. Typically you're mixing these things together but Anyway, what are convolutional neural networks used for? So traditionally we use convolutional neural networks for image tasks. But as of recently, and by recently I mean like one to two plus years, <laughs> um, convolutional neural networks actually appear to be outperforming recurrent neural networks in terms of doing sequential types of data. So obviously if you guys aren't already familiar with recurrent neural networks, that's totally fine. We haven't really talked about those yet. But if you have heard of recurrent neural networks, I'm not even sure I'm going to cover recurrent neural networks in this series because convolutional neural networks seem to be actually doing better than recurrent nets on sequential types of data. So, and that's one dimensional convolutional neural networks. Anyway, moving along, typically or the main use case is imagery. So let me explain how convolutional neural networks work. I'm going to go give a very high level explanation of this. If you want to dig deeper, again, I think I'm pretty good at teaching programming, I don't think I'm the greatest at visuals. So if my explanation and visuals aren't enough for you, there's tons of great visuals online that you can just do a Google search for to figure out how these things work. But anyway, here we go. So let's say you've got an image of a cat. Uh, the way a convolutional neural network works is you actually do pass the image in its form. So you don't have to flatten the image like we did with fully connected layers. A convolutional neural network accepts two-dimensional input. It also can accept three-dimensional input. So you could feed through models, uh, like actual like uh, like 3D printing models, right, to a neural network. Or you could, or um, uh, like for example, I did a while ago with Kaggle, there was like a lung cancer detection, and those lung scans were three-dimensional. So you could pass that through um, a, three, a 3D confinet and so on. But anyway, again, the most typical use case is a two-dimensional confinet. Uh, so let's say you've got an image and you're going to pass it through. Well, first of all, it's, actually, it's not just an image, it's pixels, right? So it's this two-dimensional array of pixels. And then what happens is we apply these convolutions. So the convolution is going to come over this image. And basically the convolution, its goal is to locate features of an image. So in this case, you know, this image is only, what, a five by four image. So it's a little impractical, but it's just for examples. So this window is a three by three. So generally you'll hear uh, the window is usually called a kernel. So this is a three by three convolution kernel. And so it's going to take three by three pixels and then it's going to look for a feature of those three by three um, pixels. So, but in terms of numbers, like um, the machine, again, neural networks work on numbers, not um, strings, not, you know, concepts like slant or something like that. But what it ends up doing is let's say the first layer of convolution filters basically are these kernels, it tends to find things like edges or curves or maybe corner, okay? And then it gets passed through another layer which finds more complex features that edges, curves, and corners build. So this would be things like circles and squares and stuff like that. But getting back to our initial, you know, three by three kernel, so what it does is it looks here, it tries to find a feature in this three by three, and it generates a scalar, you know, some sort of number. And then it ends up sliding that window over and again performs another convolution and basically just keeps sliding that window over the entire image. And what it ends up doing is, is basically condensing that image. So you'll pass an image and generally you'll say, hey, I want to have, uh, I want to. I want you to find 30 features of this from this image, basically. So what it's going to do is it's going to go over and find 30 of those. In this case, it found it's basically condensed into four. So you've got a two, a one, a four, and a three. Okay. So after you do your convolution, you'll wind up with something like this. So it'll just be this, you know, new condensed version of your image where basically these are yes, they're numbers, but to the machine they're features. And then we tend to do a pooling. 
So you've got this, and then you pool. Again, the pooling has a window, <clears throat> and the most common form of pooling is max pooling. So all it does, it's a really complicated algorithm, but basically inside the window, it takes the maximum value. I know, it's really challenging. So of this window, that max value is a four. And then it just slides and does that. And for max pooling, we take all of these and we pool it and it becomes this. So again, all this convolutional neural network is really doing is drastically simplifying your image and it looks for features of the image. And generally you're gonna have two, three, four, sometimes even more than that layers of these convolutional layers, okay? So again, the first convolutional layer is most likely just going to find very basic features, edges, corners, curves. Then it goes to another one, which is a combination. So that next layer is gonna be making convolutions that are combinate. So think of like, like the first layer is all it can do is generally like a three by three is a pretty common kernel size or maybe even a five by five. Anything bigger than that is actually a pretty big starting kernel size. It's pretty uncommon that you'd see that. So it, just think about like, what is a, what could you get from three by three pixels? Not very much. So that first layer, it, the features that it finds are combinations of pixels. So that's why it only finds like a corner or edge or maybe a slight curve. But then it ends up to the next layer. That next layer sees combinations of curves, edges, and corners, and it builds things out of those, right? It finds features out of those. So it finds circles and squares and so on. And then the next layer after that finds combinations of circles and squares and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's what it's doing. It's kind of reducing your image to very basic, you know, building blocks and then finds patterns of those blocks given how many layers you have. So anyway, uh, that's kind of the concept of a neural network uh, or a convolutional <laughs> neural network rather. Uh, let's go ahead and apply it to some data. Also, if you've got questions, about my explanation, feel free to leave them below or come into the Discord and ask. Uh, so the image, or the, yeah, the data set that we're going to use, you can get that by typing uh, cats vs. dogs Microsoft data set. And we're going to use this cats vs. dogs data set from Kaggle. And so if you, cats, okay, yeah, so just go ahead and click on that one, go to download and then uh, it will just start the download automatically. I've already downloaded mine. And then just put it in the directory that we're working in. Uh, once it's in there, go ahead and extract it. And what you get when you extract it is, if I can find mine, um, let me come over here. Basically you get uh, pet images here. So uh, you'll click on this and then you get these two directories. One is cat, one is dog. And as you might think, uh, inside you've got images of cats and dogs. So if I also take note, there's this thumbs.db that'll become important later. So here you can see it's just a bunch of images of little demons. And then you come over here and it's a bunch of images of adorable animals, uh, otherwise known as dogs. So uh, one thing you might notice right out of the gate is you've got various sizes of images and then you've also got color. Um, and then also some of the images, clearly the dog is the main thing in the image, but then here, you know, there's a dog in here, but there's also a human in here and there's just other stuff. The dog is not really dominating the photo. So anyway, you've got animals in, in various locations, but the goal will be to identify whether or not, like every image has either a cat or a dog. We don't have a none, <laughs> but that would be another challenge for another day. So every image definitely has a dog or a cat in it. And what we want is the neural network to determine if it's a dog or if it's a cat. So that's what we're going to do. But first we have to build the data set. So like I said before, just importing the data from, um, from uh, PyTorch and Torch Vision is basically cheating because you're skipping probably the most work that you're going to do with neural networks and that's pre-processing. So even this, we're going to have a pretty e easy time because these are pretty images to detect on, but I will at least kind of reference some of the things that you're more likely to have to do um, on a more challenging type of data set. So like I said, trying to slowly ratchet up the complexity here because on realistic problems, 
uh, you'll find that neural networks aren't quite as easy as online tutorials make them seem. <laughs> they aren't just magical problem solvers. So, so I mean, they are, but you have to work at it. So coming over here, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're gonna just going to start completely fresh. Also, shouts out to Vincent7 for sharing with me how to make the default font size larger in code cells. You're a hero, my friend. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so, um, so we're first we're going to make some imports. We're going to import OS, import CV2, import NumPy as NP, and from TQDM we're going to import TQDM. If you don't have some of those, those are third-party libraries. So if you don't have those, uh, let me let's just pop up a quick terminal here. Uh, do a pip pip install opencv-python. Uh, if you don't have NumPy, then grab NumPy. And if you don't have TQDM, grab TQDM. You already have OS. That comes with Python. So uh, once we've done that, uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a little flag called rebuild data. I'm going to set that to be true for now. But basically, in your pre-processing data set, you don't want to build data every single time you run your code. So you probably just want to run it one time. Often it will be the case that you separate out your pre-processing data set from your neural network code. But sometimes there's not that much code to be written, so you'll use like a flag or something like that. But generally the pre-processing step can take a pretty long time. In our case, this is a simple data set and it's not very huge, so it won't take very long. But um, there, are, there are lots of times I've got pre-processing step that takes more than a day even to run. So it's, it can be quite painful. So you, so you just want to run it as few times as you, as you have to run it. All right, I'm back. Somebody at the door, uh, they were trying to tell me about the benefits of being a channel member. Uh, if you click that beautiful blue join button, apparently you get early access to videos. Uh, you get a special rank in the Discord as well as your own little channel hidden away from all the other amateurs. Uh, also, clicking that subscribe button is apparently also beneficial in, in certain ways. I guess you get notified about videos and stuff, especially if you hit the little bell. Anyway, interesting information. Back to the tutorial. <laughs> so, um, so after yeah, the flag, basically we're going to make a class here. I'm going to say it's dogs verse cats and you don't necessarily have to have a class for what we're going to do but generally for doing image processing many of the steps that you're going to do are steps that you probably want to take uh, with just about any image uh, prediction task so you're going to do a lot of the same methods every single time so sometimes it can be convenient to have something like this uh, going. But anyway, we probably don't even need this to be a class, but I'm going to make it a class. So uh, so first of all, we're going to specify the size of the image. We're going to go with 50. And basically, we're going to make images 50 by 50. <clears throat> so part of the problem is all of these images are varying sizes and shapes. Some are more portrait, some are landscape. That's a problem. We need them to be uniform on the input. Uh, there are ways that we can get a, uh, around this uh, but way more advanced than what I want to talk about. So what we want is these to all be normalized in the sense that they're all the same size. So the way that we're going to do that is just quite literally, um, let's just take any of these really, we'll take this little pupper, and it, we're just going to resize them. So 50, we'll make them all 50 by 50, and as you can see, that's still very clearly a dog. Some of these uh, will get relatively distorted. I'm trying to, here's one. Well, that's already a terrible photo. That's just a sad looking dog. <laughs> Let's resize. Uh, I'm trying to find, here, this one looks like it might be good. Let's see, what, is, what are your dimensions, good sir? Even this one's not too far off. But anyway, oh, we want the smallest dimension to be 50, right? So it distorts the image a little bit, but it still is clearly a dog. Um, I'm trying to find like one that's like really good, like maybe this one. Although this is, this isn't really a dog. This is like a basically a cat, um, but it should still work for what we're trying to show. So if we said 50, uh, you resize that. Oh, whoops. Actually, what we wanted to say is don't maintain the aspect ratio 50 by 50. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> but still clearly, at least to me, I would say that is a 
attempt at being a dog, it's definitely not a cat. So we'll close this, and that's basically what we're going to do. Now, there's other things that we could do. I can't believe I was resizing those without changing the aspect ratio, but whatever. Um, so, so we'll do this image. <laughs> so if we resize this image, we want the largest one to be 50, and the smallest one, the other thing that you could do is you could just pad, right? So you could resize and then pad with OpenCV. That, this is pretty close to what it would do. Um, and then you can pad it as either white or black or whatever you want to do. So there's padding that you can do. There's also other operations that you can do with images. One thing you can do is you can shift. So you can just shift over the image and then crop as needed. You can rotate images. You can flip them either vertically or horizontally. So there's lots of ways that you can kind of augment your data set and just and honestly, it ends up being like if you flip or rotate the image enough or you change colors enough, you can act like it's 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 a way to take one image and make it like four images. So you can like 4x your training data size. So that's pretty useful. Again, uh, not going to do that. We're going to keep that as simple this as simple as possible. Just know all those operations exist. And chances are, if you have a much more challenging task, you're going to be doing stuff like that. But for now, we're going to do it really simply. Uh, we're just going to resize everything to 50 by 50. And uh, luckily for us, this is a relatively easy task that we're asking of the machine. There are pretty definite feature differences between dog and cat. So we can get away with this. So what we're going to say now is we're just going to give the uh, cats and then dogs directory location. So this is just pet images slash uh, cat. Dogs is uh, pet images slash dog. And then we're going to say labels. And we're going to say cats, oops, cats, we'll say those are now a zero, and then dogs, we'll say that's a one class. And we'll end up converting these to be a one hot vector, but for now, this is just nice and simple. So we'll do that. Uh, now, uh, because mostly this will give me the opportunity to show you guys, because sometimes you will have training data sets that are pre-labeled, but very rarely are they pre-labeled in one hot vector format. They're pre-labeled with just like class values like this. And I think one hot vectors just make more sense. I think the whole vagary of saying, hey, yeah, it outputs 10, but then we somehow compute loss on a single value doesn't really make sense. Um, so anyway, those are the label or the classes that we're going to say cats are a zero, dogs are a one. So now what we're going to do <clears throat> is finally we're going to say uh, training data. And that's going to be an empty list for now, but that's what we're going to populate uh, with images of cats and their labels and dogs and their labels. Uh, finally, we're going to say cat count. Cat count equals zero. Dog count equals zero. Not one. Uh, and we're just going to use this as a counter as we uh, append training samples to training data. We just want to count again because we need to always be weary of balance. Balance will tag you so many times in this journey of machine learning and deep learning. Just get it ingrained immediately to pay attention to balance. It will it will mess with you. So so now <clears throat> uh, what we're gonna say is define make training data. Pass self here. And uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate for label in self dot labels. Uh, so it's just going to iterate over cats and dogs. So keep in mind label this. So for label and labels, this is iterating over the keys of our dictionary. The keys are cats and dogs and those point to here. So it's a directory. So for label in self dot labels, what do we want to do? Uh, first, let's go ahead and we'll just print label just so we can see what's going on. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to load in that image. So cv2 dot read and then we want to read in um, well, first we need to make, let's make the path. So we're going to say path equals os.path.join. And we want to join uh, the label. And, um, well, we also need to, we need to iter iterate over the directories. Let me do this real quick. Uh, so for label, so now what we want to do is um, for f in, and then we want to iterate over all the the images in the directory. So here we're iterating over the directories. What we want to actually do is iterate over all of the image images within the directory. So for f in, um, well, we want to say os dot list dir of label because that's your directory. But we're also going to use tqdm. So tqdm is just a progress bar basically, just so you know kind of where you are. 
that's it. You'll see it when we get there if you've not seen me use TQDM before. So F will be just the file name itself. What we want is actually the full path to the image. So we're going to say path equals os.path.join label and F. And then we're going to say image equals cv2.mread path. And then we're going to uh, convert that image to grayscale. So it'll be cv2.mread underscore grayscale. So we'll convert it to grayscale. Again, with, with images and convnets, you don't have to convert to grayscale uh, like we did with MNIST, for example, in the regular dense layer. A dense layer or a linear layer or a fully connected layer, whatever the heck you want to call those basic neural network layers, those will require you to pass flattened data. But a convolutional layer, it could be flat, so you can have a one-dimensional convolutional neural network. You can have a two-dimensional convolutional neural network. You can have a three-dimensional convolutional neural network. You can have an eight-dimensional convolutional neural network. You can have any amount of dimensions that you want. I don't think eight is built in. We might, you might have four dimensions built into PyTorch. I want to say TensorFlow has 4D convnets just built in, but you can make them yourself as well. Anyway, we're going to do a 2D, so it's just X and Y. We're not going to deal with color, but if you want, color doesn't actually add another dimension. What color adds are channels. So whether we have color or not actually doesn't really matter with a convnet, but it's added data that we don't need. So one question that you would ask yourself is, is color a relevant feature of define, uh, determining whether something is a cat or a dog? I don't think it is. Like, I just don't think so. Um, it's like saying, like, is fur relevant? I don't think so. I think cats and dogs have pretty similar coat colors. The things that are different in cats and dogs are like the patterns, right? Like very rarely, if ever, have I ever seen like a striped dog, right? But lots of cats are kind of stripy. So anyway, I don't think color matters. So we want to, you always want to simplify, simplify, simplify with neural networks. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to learn. And the other thing you always are trying to do is make as small as possible of a neural network. So anyway, we are going to go with grayscale. Again, that act that does make the, the neural network also smaller. It's simpler data coming in, but also because it's less channels, it's immediately smaller as well. But anyways, uh, so we've got the grayscale images, but now we want to resize those. So we're going to say uh, image equals cv2.resize. We're going to resize the image, and then the dimensions that we're going to resize to are self dot um, image size by self dot image size. So we have our resized image. Now we're ready to self dot training underscore data dot append, and we want to append uh, the numpy array of image as well as the class. Now we're going to use one hot vectors this time. So the last time again, we used scalar values. Um, I think it's more clear if everything's in a one hot vector format, plus we get to use better loss metrics or ones that make more sense. So uh, that's what I'm going to do now. I just, I think it makes more sense to do that. But um, just remember you can go either way and depending on which way you go, you're going to use a different loss metric. But anyway, the way that we can convert uh, scalar values like this to one hot vectors. And again, a one hot vector, like we've got two classes here. So cats equals zero, dogs equals one. If we convert this to one hot vector, there's two classes. So the vector in theory would be a zero, zero if, if there was no hot. If it's a dog, it's a zero, one. If it's a cat, it's a one, zero. Okay, it's what index is hot, so to speak, on. So <clears throat> the way that we can convert things to um, one hot vectors is with a function called numpy i. And if somebody knows why specifically this is called i, let me know, because I don't know. But what this is going to do is it's going to make a five by five with the with basically one's diagonal. So here you have it, one, two, you know, it's just basically the zeroth index, the first is, and so on. So what we can do though is now, if we have a class, so cats are a zero, dogs are one. So what we put here is it's there's two total classes, and then we're gonna say the zeroth index. 
what that gives us is a one zero. If we say the first index, what it gives us is a zero one. And this is true for however many classes you have. So if it was 10 and it's a seven, this would make the one, this perfect one hot vector for us. So it's kind of a neat little trick uh, to, to giving us a way to make these one hot vectors in literally one function call. So pretty cool. So that's what we're going to use here as well. So we're gonna say numpy i two, and then the class that's hot will just be self dot uh, labels for whatever that label is. So here is your full line. Again, to uh, text-based version of the tutorials are in the description. So if any part of this you miss or something, or sometimes I code and my face is in the way like this, um, if that ever happens, check the text-based version of the tutorial. So, uh, so now we're appending all this information to our uh, training data. The next thing that we want to do is if label is equal to self dot cats, we're going to say cat count. Actually, it should be self self dot cat count uh, plus equals one. And then l if the label is self dot dogs, let's do self dot dog count uh, plus equals one. That way we'll get the counts at the very end. And basically our goal is that these sh these two should be either identical or very close. If not, we need to throw away the sam some of the samples from the class that has way more samples. So uh, you don't need a perfect distribution, but ideally it should be very, very, very close. Or really better put, any one, uh, any one class should be relatively close to the other one. So sometimes you might have, let's say, 100 classes. But if out of 100 classes, one of those classes occupies, let's say, 3% of the training data, that's huge compared to all the other ones. It's more than three times. So again, as your neural network optimizes initially, it's going to optimize for that one class, and then it's going to get stuck and totally lost. So anyway, just keep that in mind. We want these all to have about the same number of samples. So, uh, so four labels, so four F. Eh. Uh, the other thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna encase this in a try and accept, and I'm going to pass accept exception as E, but if you want, you can print string E. I'm not going to, uh, because I already know what's going on, but <clears throat> what is going on is for whatever reason, some of these images are no good. Uh, so when you try to load them in, you're gonna get an error. Um, or maybe it's on the resize. Anyways, some of the images are goofy. They're either corrupt or they're just empty, like there's no actual image there. So you're going to hit an error. Um, so we're just going to handle for that now. And because we're printing out cat count and dog count, we'll know pretty quickly if something went terribly wrong. Um, but normally you would print stringy there for sure. But I'm just letting you know that I already know there's errors and I know they're worthless. So anyways, I'm just going to pass there. So once you've done that, Basically, you have this training data, which is going to be this massive list of a bunch of cats with the label of cat and a bunch of dogs with the label of dog. What we then need to do, of course, is shuffle that data. So uh, outside of here, tab, tab, so two tabs over. So basically, after we've run this for loop, what do we want to do? We're going to say numpy.random.shuffle, and we want to shuffle self.training underscore data. This, like random.shuffle, as well shuffles in place so you don't reassign it just shuffles in place uh, the next thing we're going to do is numpy.save and we're going to save this as training data.numpy or npy and then self.training data is what we want to save now let's print out um print cats and then we'll print self or actually um uh, yeah, self dot cat count. Self dot cat count. Print dogs. Self dot dog count. And I think we're ready to actually run this. <laughs> and hopefully, no major errors. I'm sure we'll get some. So then, what we're gonna say is if we'll just say rebuild data if that's set to true dog v cats equals dogs versus cats and then dog dog let's make this dogs v cats dogs v cats 
dot make training data. Let's go. All right. So it's loading in pretty quickly there. Cool. Okay, so uh, we're going to make sure we don't hit any major errors. Hopefully we don't. I at least want to see the counts of cats and dogs. But once we've done that, um, I think probably in the n we'll do the next tutorial and actually um, start like going through our data, splitting it into training and testing, because that was another thing that we didn't really have to do. Uh, and then passing it through the network, training, all that, iterating, doing batches, all that kind of stuff. We got to... There's a lot more to go even bef still before we pass it through the network, but I think we'll do that and pass it through the network in the next video. Anyway, <clears throat> so here we can see what the balance is. It's 12,476 to 12,470. So as you can see here, we lost 24 images. Well, you don't know this, but the goal was to have 12,500 images of cats, 12,500 of dogs. Actually, you could have read it here. The extra one is uh, for the database, uh, which we would have aired out anyways. So that was the other thing. So <laughs> yay for try and accept. <laughs> so, so if I open this up, um, the other thing that we see here, if we go back to list mode and we sort by type, you'll see there's also a thumbs.database. <laughs> I don't know why that's there, but that is there. Uh, so, so we will have tried to open thumbs.database with OpenCV imread. Uh, that will have failed as well. But we handled it because we're expert programmers with our passes on exceptions. Okay, so so we've got uh, some training data. So the next thing, um, I guess we'll, let me just do this real quick. So let's do training data equals np.load uh, training data.numpy. So we've saved it then to get it back in. So we only hopefully run this one time and we're done. We'll never run this again in this tutorial. So let's set this to false unless we have some sort of other error that we hit. But now we try to maybe um, object arrays can't be loaded in when allow pickle is false. Why are we allowing pickle to false? Why would that be the case? I wonder if something which of these things would have not allowed pickle? Huh. Let's let's just try to throw in allow um, pickle to true. I've never had to do that. Let's try that. Cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alrighty. So uh, first, let's print uh, len training data. Let's just see what we've got. Yep, about twenty-five thousand. So that's all of our samples. So then the next thing that we could do is let's say um, print uh, training data zero. That should be the image and the class. So this is, should be an image of a cat. Uh, let's do one. Okay, so it already goes to dog. Um, I'd rather show an image of a dog anyway, so let's do that. So then what we're gonna say is import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. Uh, and then what we'll do is plt dot m show. Uh, we should be able to just show this zero. Um, oh, we haven't even scaled this. We might have to scale that as well. But I just want to make sure that everything worked as intended. Uh, and so we'll just plot plt m show, and then plt dot show. See how that works. Um, pretty hard to tell it's a dog to be honest, but it's but for example <laughs> Dogs generally have longer legs than cats um, The tail is generally more fluffy and so on so I can tell that's a dog But uh, so one thing that we could do is someone someone even brought this up. Why why is it all funky colored? It's just because matplotlib is first of all It's a charting program not really meant to show images Although in this case it is kind of goofy that it can't do it But it's because this is a grayscaled image that it it just doesn't quite know what to do with it So one thing we can say is we can say cmap for a color map equals did that just get rid of my parentheses again? Why does it keep doing that? <laughs> That's silly. Why does it keep doing that? Um, we'll set this to be gray What? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing my mind. PLT to show. Okay, so now it's like a grayscale. So this is really more what the neural network sees. Why did that happen? That's super crazy. Is it because of insert? Did I hit insert at some point? Yeah, I guess I must have hit insert. 
that's got weird behavior when you have insert on. Okay, so, uh, and then if we wanted, so training data one, zero, and if we print one, one, you can see there's the classification. So now what we wanna do is start taking batches of this data, passing it through our neural network, optimizing, and learning how to classify this as dogs and cats and so on. So that's what we're gonna do in the next video. Uh, probably the only real new concept is one, how to make convolution layers, and then two, batching data, uh, and then we might start putting things on the GPU. We'll see, we'll see what I feel like doing. Um, anyway, questions, comments, concerns, whatever, feel free to leave those below. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video.